little bit of you again in Goldburn on this uh, December 30th, uh, within the octave of Christmas. And uh, a few considerations today, taken primarily from the, uh, actually from the, from the introit, and also um, from the, the Feast of Tomorrow, the Feast of St. Sylvester. We won't read the Epistle and Gospel but later on the intro here. Mm -hmm. So then, uh, we can see the then, and the Father and the Son of the Ghost, Amen. So this uh, tomorrow, the 31st of December, is the Feast of St. Sylvester, the Pope, and uh, at the time of Constantine the Great. And he's an example, in fact, of the, the life of St. Sylvester, is an example of the changes made in the Church in the last 200 years bringing into question all of the teachings of the ancients. Sylvester was a pope who was the pope when uh, Constantine became the emperor in 312 AD. And Constantine the Great became emperor because of the Battle of Milvian Bridge. And uh, Constantine fought against his uh, Maxentius, his, uh, his, uh, uh, the one who was his tetrarch rival as the Emperor of Rome at the Battle of Milvian Bridge, and his smaller army defeated and wiped out the army of Maxentius. And there are two things that happened. One of them was that the night before the battle, there was a sign that appeared in the sky. An angel came and appeared to Constantine the Great, and the sign of the Kiro, the P and the X in the sky, appeared, and the, the sign of Christ on the cross. And the angel told him, in this sign you shall conquer, in hoc signo vinces. Put this sign on the shields of your soldiers, on their clothing, and they will conquer. And so the sign was visible in the sky, and Constantine required that all the soldiers copy the sign in whatever way they could, on their shields, on their helmets, on their, on their clothing, and somewhere on them to put this sign. They went into battle the next morning, and the much larger army of Maxentius was destroyed. But a second thing also happened on that day, and that is, Maxentius was a Roman, and he had the larger army, and was the one who was favored in the battle. Constantine was also a Roman, had a smaller army, and uh, seemed like he would be defeated in the battle, but it still wasn't totally certain. And so the, the Maxentius appeared, talked to the pagan priest, the Roman pagan priest, and he said, who's going to win the battle tomorrow? And the pagan priest he went to the gods and he said, I spoke to the gods and the gods told me that tomorrow the enemy of Rome shall fall. And so Maxentius was very much encouraged. The enemy of Rome shall fall. And then the battle happened. And Maxentius was wiped out and the army was wiped out and Constantine won. And he grabbed that priest, the pagan priest, he brought him before him and said, you are a priest of Maxentius and I'm going to kill you. And the priest said, no, no, you can't kill me. Because yesterday, I told Maxentius to the face. He asked me who would win this battle, and I told him right to his face, the enemy of Rome shall fall. Now, the only problem was, you had a Roman tetrarch fighting against a Roman tetrarch. And whichever one won, the other one was the enemy of Rome. And whichever one won, the pagan priest won. So he stood up in front of all the Romans and he says, I told Maxentius to the face, the enemy of Rome shall fall. I predicted the victory of Constantine, and therefore Constantine could not kill Maxentius. It also caused confusion for Constantine, because the night before the battle, he saw the sign in the, in the sky that said, in this sign you shall conquer. And it was the god of the Christians that won the battle. But then, when the battle was won, he sure heard the, the pagan priest said, I said the same thing last night. 
And so Constantine was confused. Which God is the God that gave me the victory? And therefore he stayed a pagan. And Constantine contracted leprosy. He got leprosy during the course of that year. And he was going to die as a leper. And the pagan priest came to him and said, Constantine, you must cure your leprosy. And the way you will cure your leprosy is you must take 300 innocent babies from their mothers. You must kill them. We must drain their blood into a bath. And you must wash in the blood of these babies. And then your leprosy shall be cured. So Constantine gathered together 300 babies, took their mothers and 300 babies, and he was going to kill them. And as he was going to kill them, he rode off on his horse, and the mothers all came to him, the 300 mothers, all haggard and weeping, and they said, please don't kill our babies. And Constantine, still a pagan, looked at them, and he said, this is against the pietas romanitas, romanitatis. This is against, the pati this is against Roman piety. He says, because we have a rule in our army, that when we attack the enemies, the barbarians, that our soldiers are told not to kill babies. And if they kill a baby, we slay them. So if our soldiers should not kill pagan and barbarian babies, then why should I kill the babies of Rome? So that I might wash in their blood and be cured of leprosy. And will I really be cured of leprosy? I am not sure. Better for me, one Roman, even though an emperor, to die, than to kill 300 babies so that I might possibly live, but I'm not sure if I will live. Therefore he changed his mind, he did not listen to the pagan priest, and he told them, I will not kill you. He went to bed that night, and the angel appeared to him again. And the angel said to him the second time, and he said, Constantine, you have done well to not kill the babies of your own race. Because you have done this, however, I will tell you that you can wash you can bathe. Go and get Sylvester the bishop. He's the bishop of this city of Rome. And he is the bishop of my church. Go and get the bishop Sylvester. He is in hiding in such and such a place outside the city. Send your soldiers to that place. Get Sylvester and bring him here. And he will wash you three times in a water that shall take away your leprosy and will make you clean. And therefore Constantine sent soldiers to Sylvester. Now, Constantine sent soldiers to Sylvester, and he went, they went to Sylvester, and, they, and the Sylvester saw the soldiers coming. And every single pope before him, when they saw soldiers coming, they were martyred. And Sylvester thought for sure, they're coming to arrest me and kill me. So therefore, Sylvester, without fear, walked out and said, I am, the, I am Sylvester. I am the Bishop of Rome. Take me. And they came, and they took him. But to his surprise, they did not take him to be martyred. They took him before the Emperor Constantine. And then in front of Constantine, they said to Constantine, that here is Sylvester. And, so, and Constantine said, Sylvester, I was told in a dream by an angel. The same angel told me some time ago, before the Battle of Milvian Bridge, he told me that I would win by this sign. You know about this sign? Yes, it's a sign of Jesus Christ upon the cross, a sign of the true God. But he also told me, that if I, instead of washing my, my, my body in the blood of little babies to end leprosy, you can cure my leprosy by giving me a three washings, three washings in holy water of some kind, and it will take away my leprosy. And somebody said, yes, I can. I can wash you by three washings. This is called the sacrament of baptism. But I cannot wash you today. You must first accept that Jesus Christ is true God and true man. You must accept the Christ who showed you that sign before you won the battle. You must embrace his faith, his divine teachings. You must also, as emperor, end the persecution of the church because your ancestors have persecuted our Holy Mother of the Church. And you shall not, not at all persecute it, but not only that, you shall worship the true God and you shall make Rome to worship the true God. And if you do these things, then you shall be removed of your leprosy. Here St. Sylvester imitated the priest Valentine. Only he was the Pope. About 60 years before, Valentine, St. Valentine, stood in front of the Emperor Datius and he said, Datius, if you want to have a long reign, accept the true God of the Christians, our God, the Catholic God. Enter into his church and then you shall have a long reign. 
And Datius almost listened to Valentine, but in the end, he was afraid because of the pagan priests. But Constantine lost the fear of those pagan priests. He realized there was something wrong. And so he lost the fear of the pagan priests. He had seen the power of the true God by the miracle of the Battle of Milpian Bridge. And he said, perhaps another miracle can also happen. Therefore, he accepted the true faith. And a short time afterwards, he was washed by the triple baptism of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And his leprosy was taken away. And he became a great defender of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. He built the Church of St. Peter's in Rome, the very first Church of St. Peter's. He built it. Constantine the Great took his treasury. He made a decree that in Rome there shall be accepted the true religion of the Catholics. And he made ten different decrees. And the tenth decree was that there shall be a tenth part of all the income of the Roman Empire. A tenth part of all taxes shall be given to God. And the way that we shall, the government shall tithe to God is that that tenth part shall be used for building churches. And he then showed his, his power by building several churches. He built St. John Lateran's. He built St. Paul outside the walls. And he built the church of St. Peter's. And he also built other churches. Three of the great seven basilicas, the original ones, built by him. And he built the, the, the gate of the St. Peter of St. Peter's <coughs> Basilica. He said, I will build a basilica on the very place where Peter is buried. We will build there and make that place. My ancestor, the emperor Nero, brought him to death. My ancestor, the emperor, crucified him. My ancestor, the emperor, had him buried in a place of slaves. And I, Constantine, will make it a place of glory. I shall build there the most magnificent church of all Christendom. And he built it. And when the Catholics saw Constantine not only freed up the religion in the, in the decree of Edict of Milan, 313, but he also proved that he meant what he said. Because remember, he was not the first emperor to do, give an edict of freedom of religion for the Catholic Church. The last one to do it was very well freshly remembered in the mind of all Catholics, and that was Diocletian. Diocletian became the emperor in 284 AD. And shortly after he became emperor, he said, I love Catholics. I think Catholics are the best people in my kingdom. And he granted a freedom of the practice of the true religion amongst all Catholics. And for 20 years, Catholics roamed freely. And they became openly known, I am a Christian, I am a Christian, I am a Christian. In 284, he became emperor. In the year 302, 20, almost 20 years later, Diocletian changed his mind. And Diocletian, by the, by the behest of a wicked witch, and by the behest of, the, of wicked pagans and, his, and, and the priests that were still around him, he said, I will bring an end to Christianity. And he announced, he began the largest persecution in the history of the church. And the reason why so many were killed by Diocletian is because for almost 20 years, the Catholics were openly known. They were not in secret for almost 20 years. They were freely running around. They were practicing their true faith in public. Everyone knew he's a Christian, he's a Christian, he's a Christian, he's a Christian. And then all of a sudden, Diocletian said, it's illegal to be a Catholic. And now I want everyone to accept the, the, the religion of paganism, of pagan Rome, or you'll be put to death. And hence, it was the greatest persecution from 302 to 305 AD. Just three years. And then Diocletian went insane. And he died six years later in 311. He was insane, and he thought he was an animal. He lived like Nebuchadnezzar. He ate grass. He was nuts, but he was still alive. He died in 311, and when he died, now there was a fight. Who's going to be emperor next? And Constantine and Maxentius were the great contenders of the four tetrarchs. And Constantine and Maxentius fought to be who's going to be the next emperor. So not only was it, it was extremely fresh in the mind of Catholics. Your predecessor, Diocletian, he said we can practice our religion too. Your predecessor, Diocletian, said come out and open and be good, and be good Romans. And he changed his mind. And there were hundreds of thousands of us killed. Are you for real? What is it that made the Catholics of Rome realize that Constantine was for real? His mother, St. Helena, was a firm Catholic. And she made sure that her son remained firm in the faith. And she built churches herself. And she went to Jerusalem and she found the Holy Cross. And she built churches in Jerusalem. And she made sure that it was well known that the religion, we are not like, my son is not like Diocletian. Diocletian said yes to the Catholics, yes to the Catholics, but he never became a Catholic. 
And then he was nice to the Catholics, nice to the Catholics, but then he changed his mind and he slaughtered them. But my son, my son Constantine, he has been baptized. He entered into the true church. He was cured of leprosy. It was the true God that gave him the victory at the Battle of Milvian Bridge. He is a firm Catholic. The Catholic faith has entered his blood. He has built churches and built churches. You must believe that he is sincere in his Catholicism. And so Constantine was. He is the one who called together the Canicea Council in 325. He was so interested in the church, a little too interested because he tried to control the church, but he was so interested in the church that he wanted the church to grow and to wax strong. And he heard about the Arian crisis. And he didn't know whether he should be Arian or he should be Catholic. He wanted to believe in the real Jesus. But was the real Jesus God, like Sylvester said? Or was the real Jesus a God like man, like Arius said? He wasn't sure. So he called together all the bitches of the world in Nicaea. And there they gathered together. And they decreed clearly the perennial, eternal teaching of the church that Jesus Christ is true God and true man. And Constantine was there. Constantine did really become Catholic. He was really baptized by St. Sylvester when he experienced the, 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 the leprosy. However, in the 19th century, Catholic historians in the 1830s and 50s, they decided to research again. Did Constantine really get baptized? Did Constantine wait to be baptized? And some of them surmised Constantine, later on he would murder his own son. He did. He murdered his own son later on. He made some great mistakes later on in his own reign. He was not a perfect saint. They said, well, he murdered his own son when he was later on in his reign. The one who was one good son that he had, he killed his own good son who would have been a great emperor after him. He was deceived and he killed him. And he, he also tried to control the church too much. And he moved the, the see of, 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 of uh, the, the Roman Empire from Rome to Constantinople, which would take on his own name, to Byzantium, which name would be changed to the name of Constantinople. And he did that because he thought Constantinople was a more beautiful town than Rome. He had a little bit of uppity pride in him. He wasn't a perfect saint, so maybe he didn't get baptized in 313. Maybe that didn't really happen. And we conjecture, as wise historians, that he actually wasn't baptized in 313. But in fact, he knew that, that you, when you get baptized, all your sins are wiped away. And so they wrote down in many history books of the 19th century, many Catholic history books, Constantine was not baptized by St. Sylvester. This is an apocryphal story. St. Sylvester was a saint. St. Sylvester was a pope. St. Sylvester did many holy things, but he did not baptize St. Peter. I mean, uh, Constantine. And Constantine did build the Church of St. Peter's, but it was just as a gesture. It wasn't in thanksgiving for his cure of leprosy. It wasn't because he firmly believed in Christ. And then he called the Council of Nicaea, and he showed a great interest in the Catholic Church throughout the entirety of his reign, and he also slowly eradicated paganism throughout the entirety of his reign. Maybe these are signs, historical signs, that he really was baptized by St. Sylvester. But what happened? The modern theologians, the modern historians, who developed a new science called the historical critical method, by which they would study every fact of history and reinterpret it. Is it a heresy? Is it a heresy to say that Constantine was not baptized by St. Sylvester? No, it's not a heresy. Is it true that he was baptized by St. Sylvester? Yes, it is. But can, we, can, can you question it? You can question anything with a modern skepticism. And in this way, they went through the lives of the saints. A priest in England called Alvin Butler decided to put together Butler's Lives of the Saints. And there were many other priests who did the same thing as him, putting together Lives of the Saints. And they put together Lives of the Saints, and they speak of the word, the legend of John, uh, of the various saints, the legend of Agatha, the legend of Cecilia, the legend of Anastasia, the legend of St. Sylvester. And then it, they said, Sylvester, he performed miracles, but we're not sure if he actually baptized Constantine. We're not sure if, if, uh, if the St. Christopher actually carried Christ across the waters. Maybe he never did. And we're not sure about this. 
And we're not sure about that, but we do believe that they're saints, and the records are a bit scanty, but of course we know they're holy, and we do believe in miracles, but not necessarily every miracle, and some miracles are true, and other miracles may not be, but the important thing is, we believe they're saints. And the important thing is, they did perform some miracles, we just can't say that every miracle is a miracle. They entered skepticism, entered skepticism into the lives of the saints. Skepticism in the writings of the, of the fathers and the writings of the doctors, and particularly their historical writings. And they said, well, we can't say for sure if Christopher really crossed that river with Jesus Christ and the soldiers. We can't really say for sure that Clement of Rome really was thrown by an anchor in the middle of the Black Sea, and the sea went back, and there was a, there was a, a, a church built by angels. And then they brought his body back to shore. I don't know. That seems a bit apocrypha to me. Now, he was a saint. He was a holy pope. He was spiritual. This is the beginning of modernism. St. Pius X says, Modernists teach that no man can do an extraordinary thing, and no man ever does anything that appears to be extraordinary except for selfish motives. And he says, this is a dogma of the modernists. They do not prove it. They just say, if anything extraordinary happened, it didn't happen. We've got to find an ordinary explanation. Now, the beginning of this was found in the historical criticism of the 19th century. And one of the examples is St. Sylvester. Another example is St. Clement of Rome. Another example is St. Christopher. So the one we find in 1969, in 1968, that Paul VI dropped St. Christopher, and he's no longer considered a saint. And other saints are dropped. And the stories of the saints are removed from the Holy Breviary. One of the changes in the Breviary of 1962, for instance, is that the stories of the saints were, were shortened. They were shortened and shortened and shortened. And many of the miracles left out. We saw that, were these things heresies? No, they're not heresies. But what do they do? A young man goes to the seminary. And I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in all the teachers of the church. I want to fight all the modernists. Very good. But you got to understand, not everything you were taught was right. Many things were, and some things weren't. What are we doing? Poking holes, poking holes, poking holes. Partial truths, partial truths, partial truths. Lie, truth, 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 lie. Truth, 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 lie. Poking holes. So that now, the child, the young man is becoming a priest, the young theologian, the young scripture scholar, he's no longer sure of anything. He no longer can stand upon a rock. Now, we do not say that every single writing about the saints is true. If you read Jacobus de Voragine, Jacobus, who wrote the book called The Golden Legend, he points out many fantastic miracles of the saints. But if you read what he says, he says, this miracle has a good foundation. Many witnessed it. But other miracles, we're not sure if they really happened. Even Jacobus, a great and holy bishop of the 1200s, recognizes that no, we don't know every detail about every saint. We don't know every miracle of every saint, but we do know the principal miracles, and we do know what is believable and what is not. St. Sylvester did baptize Constantine, and if he did not baptize Constantine, it would not explain as Constantine's behavior. Why is it so important to deny the baptism of Constantine by St. Sylvester? Why is it put inside of all the books in order to get into people's mind that Constantine, who was still a sinner after he was baptized, he was still a sinner. He was not perfect. But Constantine was motivated by the faith, and Constantine wanted to be a good Catholic. Constantine was a pagan emperor. He still had pagan blood. He got baptized. He took the faith very seriously, but he was still a tough guy. He was still influenced by bad influences. He still was guilty of committing sins. Most likely he saved his soul when he died. He repented of murdering his own son. He realized he made a great mistake when he murdered his own son after he murdered him. He was deceived into murdering him. But the fact is that he still murdered him. He still committed sins. He was still weak. He still wasn't perfect. But he was a man of God. And he did see that sign truly in the sky. He was not an ignoramus. He realized that it was the God of the Christians, the God of the Catholics, that made him win the Battle of Bilbian Bridge. He realized that the pagan priest was playing word games, and the pagan priest was lying when he said, the enemy of Rome shall fall, saying a very safe statement that applies to whoever wins. 
He realized also that the pagan priest who told him to wash his blood, wash a bath and the blood of babies was not the right thing to do. But when he washed in the waters of baptism, he was cured. And he showed a great spirit of thanksgiving by building so many churches. He was a great emperor. He was truly great, though he had flaws. And the greatness came from his acceptance of the Holy Roman Catholic faith. And he also blessed his mother. She had to obey him like everyone else. And she gave him funds, he gave her funds to be able to build churches in Jerusalem, to look for the Holy Cross, to, to make sure that Jerusalem was brought to be the Catholic city it was supposed to be. She also, he also made sure that the, the Catholic faith was spread throughout all of his kingdom. And there was a great rebellion against it by many of the pagans, but he stood strong against them. There would even be the, uh, the what do you call it, the, 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 the great, the, now I'm forgetting his name, the great, the very wicked, uh, emperor, who the pagan, who would go against Constantine several emperors later. He did not. He hated what Constantine had done, that, and so that he fought against him. The very famous name. Now I can't even think of it. That, that he was simply he fought against him. And he died. And the last words of that emperor were, "O Galilean, thou hast won. Thou hast defeated me, Galilean." And that pagan emperor, the son of great grandson of Constantine, died. Not everyone accepted him. He stood strong. He stood strong because he was baptized. He stood strong because of St. Sylvester. He stood strong because he really believed in that Holy Roman faith. And what happened? Modern historians came in in the 1800s and they cut and cut and cut and cut. And they cut the stories of the truth. And they created doubt here and doubt there and doubt here and doubt there. So that for the, for the last 200 years, young men being formed to be priests were formed <coughs> to believe in the 12 articles of the creed. Formed to believe in the teachings of our church with doubts, with questions, with uncertitude, and show that it was not just wicked men, six wicked Protestants, who decided to make a new mass. They were there for window dressing. They didn't know anything about it. It was Catholics preparing for hundreds of years that made the new mass. It was not because a couple liberals showed up in 1962. It wasn't because of Cardinal Bonini that all of a sudden they threw out the saints. This was prepared in advance. So that when Christopher was dropped, the young man who we are, I don't know Christopher, that we're not sure if he really carried Christ across the water anyway. We're not even sure if he's a historical figure. We're not sure if Philomena ever existed. We're not sure about Agnes and, Agnes and Anastasia. We know they're saints. Of course, we believe they're saints, but we're not sure exactly what happened to them. We don't know. So if they're going to drop them out of the calendar, I have no objection. And the faith is sucked out and sucked out and sucked out, bit by bit, piece by piece. And one of the examples of the sucking out of faith equals the changing of the life of St. Sylvester, whose feast is December the 31st, and who was a real saint, a real pope, the Holy Mother of the Church, whose great act was the act of converting Constantine the Great. He's the pope that converted Constantine the Great. And he is the reason why Constantine is Constantine the Great. And he was close to Constantine the Great, and he helped Constantine the Great, and therefore St. Sylvester was a real pope and a real saint who was a saint that did truly baptize Constantine. He truly did. And the modern historians try to change it all. No, not so. Now there are occasions when the modern historians accidentally get something right. There are occasions when, they, when the facts that were given to us by the ancients are not correct. We do not say they are infallible. However, they are far more accurate than the modern reinterpretations. And furthermore, ask yourself the reason why the modern reinterpretations. The reason is because they hate the Catholic faith. The reason is because they wish to undermine all teachings that come from our Lord Jesus Christ. They wish to undermine all prayers. As an example, one of the lies of Vatican II is... We want to change from Latin that people can understand to the vernacular. Okay, fine. If that's really what you want, then only do that. They are liars. They are liars. They don't want to change from Latin into English. If they wanted to do that, then why change the English prayer called the Hail Mary? Why change the Our Father? Why change thee and thou to you and your? Why change Holy Ghost to Holy Spirit? Why change the act of contrition? Why change the act of faith, the act of hope, and the act of charity? Why change the names of them in the English language? Why change every single song? Why change the, 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 the songs that we sing in English, 
If you want to change from Latin to English, then just change from Latin to English. They are liars. They do not want to change from Latin to English. They want to change the faith. And so likewise, these historians who say, I just want to have an accurate, realistic understanding of what happened in the days of the martyrs and what happened in the days of the saints. Well, an accurate, realistic understanding is found in the Golden Legend by Jacobus of Rajene, written in the 1200s. It is found in the sacred scripture. It is found in the teachings of the ancients who were honest and straightforward. Augustine, for instance, he did not whitewash his life. Augustine lived a wicked life. Augustine lived in sin with a woman for 13 years. Augustine had a child out of wedlock. Augustine hated God. And when he became a saint, he didn't say, oh, by the way, I was having a bad day. He didn't change history. He said it as it was. And then he repented, he converted, and became a great saint. But the hallmark of the Catholics, like Augustine, like Jerome, and like Jacobus de Miragine, and like all the great Catholic authors of the last 2,000 years, they are honest. They don't cover up the sins of the saints when before they became saints. They don't cover up the sins of popes. They don't cover when Honorius was wicked. And what did St. Leo II say? St. Leo II said, Honorius was a heretic. Honorius is in hell. St. Leo II did not cover up the sins of his ancestors, the pope, that it was the pope, two popes before him. We don't cover up the falsities and the weaknesses and the sins of our people, but we have the truth. And the truth is, whenever Honorius acts wicked, as Pope Honorius, he's acting against his papacy. And whenever Augustine acts wicked, he's acting against the truth. And Augustine changed from the wicked Augustine to the holy Augustine. And when we said, who are the historians? The historians said, Constantine was baptized by St. Sylvester. Constantine had a firm conversion. And the same historian says, and then Constantine became proud afterwards. And then Constantine murdered his own son afterwards. And then Constantine, through his pride, decided he didn't like the city of Rome, wasn't pretty enough. So he moved to Constantinople. And they say, in fact, the Holy Ghost was behind that. Because if, the, if, if, if Constantine had stayed in Rome, the emperor would have too much power over the pope. And the pope would not be able to rule the church freely. But because Constantine moved to Byzantium, which would later take on his own name and be called Constantinople, because Constantine did that, Rome became free, and the Pope became the true ruler of the bishop, the true ruler of the world without the hindrance of emperors, whereas the, the patriarch Constantinople became a slave of the emperor. And so God was behind Constantine, even when in his pride he moved from Rome to Byzantium. And God, good God, was behind Constantine in his weakness and in his strength. And if we must recognize that these historians did not have the vested interest, they wrote what really happened. They just wrote the facts. Catholics are not afraid of the facts. Catholics are not afraid of the truth. But what do we find about our enemies? They're terrified of the truth because the truth points always to Christ. And the truth points away from the devil. And the truth points away from the modern lives. And therefore, the modern historians, the last 200 years, they rewrite history in order to fit the lies of their age and the ideas of their age. We Catholics don't do that. Sylvester was a true saint and a great saint, and he did truly baptize Constantine, and Constantine was a great emperor, though he had weaknesses, and he most likely saved his soul. Maybe even now he's in purgatory. But he was a great emperor who did transform the world. And he had weaknesses. But Helena, the, his mother, was a saint. And the Pope that baptized him was a saint. And he created a Catholic world for Rome. And he fought against the evils of paganism inside of Rome. Though he himself originally was a pagan. And, he, and therefore, we must recognize the valor, the strength, the wisdom, and the truth and veracity of the ancient historians over the modern fools that rewrite history in order to fit their own modern ideas. Those are going to bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.